Hello, everyone. This is um, I'm Susan Nash, AAPG. Really thrilled to have this wonderful group of presenters today. And we're going to change the, the uh, presentation order a little bit because Dan Arthur has to run to another meeting. But we have Dan Arthur, and we have Amanda Vise, and we have Sean Epps. And we will be talking about lessons learned with orphan wells and all the different things that are happening to make um, the business of orphan wells different and more exciting than it's ever been. So really glad to, to be able to get started. I'd like to say that this is also, um, we have some excellent sponsors and I will be listing those at the end and they will also appear in the show notes. We also have um, a, a meeting coming up in Pittsburgh that will be on orphan wells and please um, check the, the um, check the, the chat for information about that. And finally, I'd like to say that this is officially sponsored by the Division of Environmental Geoscientists and really thrilled about that. And again, thank you to our sponsors and welcome. So go ahead, Dan. Super, thanks, Susan. And um, I'll just say that if, uh, if you have not yet registered for the the upcoming conference and uh, day of training in Pittsburgh on the 27th, 8th, and 9th. Uh, that would be a perfect thing for you to do. We've got lots of great speakers lined up there, and I'm just, it's its exciting. I'm also, we'll just say that I'm, uh, I'm happy today to be joined by Sean Epps, who's been doing a lot in this sector, as well as Amanda Vizi. Uh, and so two, two good friends and uh, and uh, some some good stuff that I think everyone will enjoy um, today. So for me, I'm going to um, get into, go ahead. I'm going to jump in quickly because I just want to give you credit, Dan, for all the effort that you've had in this. And you and I started talking about this a couple of years ago, and you are really the powerhouse behind the scenes. So I just want to give you all the credit for that. And also with the training course on the 29th. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Susan. Well, so uh, <clears throat> I'm going to try to pull in a, a variety of things to set the stage on what I hope is a variety of levels, things that uh, that people I think have had questions about and so forth. So uh, as I go through here, uh, if you guys have heard me speak before, uh, I, I like using pictures and so forth just to give people um, some some background on on what we're talking about. So just even on this introduction slide, uh, this is early development uh, in uh, the Enid, Oklahoma area. So this is kind of Northwest Oklahoma uh, as things just got started there. So um, what a history uh, in this in this industry and and what uh, an interesting thing that we're getting into with these idle orphan and I'll say marginal conventional ones. So, so first, I you know I think it's I think it's really reasonable to to look at oil history, uh, just because I get I get uh, into so many discussions with people and labs and 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 folks doing stuff that that tend not to really um, think about this, and and I think that there's some things even when we get into say the Drake well that that a lot of people don't recognize and. And when you start thinking about having to go back and plug some of these old wells, uh, it's understanding history is is important. And, and everybody's heard me. Amanda Vizi's probably completely tired of hearing me say that, but she knows that it you that that's true. So with that said, you know there was even pre 1800s there was a lot of accounts for oil. It was just this gooky mess. Oftentimes, it would get in the way or contaminate folks that were drilling for salt. Um, if if you didn't know, like our our drill pipe that we have hollow drill pipe and do circulation, that was really developed in China for salt drilling. Um, you know, and then when we get into those early, very early 1800s, we had folks drilling for salt and in Kentucky and Ohio that uh, that were having trouble with with uh, looking for salt in those areas. There's a lot of underground salt deposits, bedded salts, and they kept running into oil. Um, 
And, uh, and then in 21, 1821, uh, that kind of bottom left picture uh, is, is a picture of the first commercial gas well they used, uh, used in, uh, in New York, Fredonia. Um, and they used it to, to light street lights and so forth. And, and when you go back and you start looking at this and, and even all the, the oil giants that came in after that, uh, you know, we don't have an appreciation today for the thought that, you know, at night it's dark and, and, and thank God we're not using lamps with, uh, with whale oil. But, but then we get into the, you know, kind of mid 1800s with Colonel Drake. And I don't know if you guys understand this, but Drake was not an engineer. He was this really technical guy uh, <clears throat> that got brought in to look for oil uh, after a, uh, another kind of a money guy had heard that people were drilling for salt and kept hitting oil. And uh, there was a need. People were gathering it uh, and, and using it uh, for very basic things. And, and uh, Drake, after almost giving up, uh, you know, wound up uh, developing the first commercial uh, oil well in, in the United States. And, and I will tell you, I'll, in March, I'm going to be giving a, a, a presentation at, a, I think it's like a wine and roses or something, uh, dinner up at the Drake Museum. So um, look at your calendars there. And if you're interested in, in some more oil history, uh, wander up there and uh, and we can talk oil history and have a glass of wine. Um, but then, you know, if we look and finally, you know, after that Drake, well, if you look by 1864, which is really just a few years after that, uh, W.B. Nolan had already drilled over 500 wells in Ohio, mostly around the Signet, Ohio area. So this happened really fast. So when you start looking at the records for this and, and, and all this, all these old wells, we're running into them in a bunch of different places, not only in the Northeast and Appalachia, but all over. <clears throat> and so if we look at this, keep looking at the the what we all have to deal with, and, and I'm only including really two of three. Uh, this, this top map is, uh, is the USGS's map on documented uh, unplugged orphan wells in the United States. And, and when you look at that, it can look pretty significant um, in, uh, in, in, in what it is. But this, this map at the bottom is idle, non-producing oil and gas wells. So, you know, I had a, a conversation with a friend of mine uh, on Saturday, who's an oil producer here in Oklahoma. He has about 50 uh, producing wells, and he has about 250 non-producing wells just on his acreage that's sitting there. And he's, I'd say, extremely worried about that future. So when we start looking at these undoc or documented uh, orphan wells, and then I will say that we have a plethora of undocumented orphan wells that aren't even counted here. And then as we look at idle non-producing wells, which I would say dwarfs that. But the other thing that we did, and I did include it in this presentation, I have some others, but <clears throat> you know, we've been working with uh, with with DOE and and the and the feds on the uh, on the marginal conventional well methane emission reduction program. And I'll just tell you, on, on low-producing marginal wells, uh, the numbers are overwhelming. So if you look at what we have ahead of us, it's a big deal. And now if you want to look, too, at, you know, why do we, why do we care? So I've got just a couple examples here. This map on the left is in the Los Angeles area. So people are probably pretty familiar with the Los Angeles, the L.A. Basin development. But those black squares on there are schools. The green dots are are idle and orphan wells. And just within a two mile radius of schools, there's about, uh, about a thousand total uh, uh, orphan non-producing wells near those schools. Uh, the one on the right is here in Oklahoma near Kellyville. Uh, within a two mile radius, we've got 170 wells uh, that are with, within schools. The gray areas in these maps too, I would say, are also uh, <clears throat> financially disadvantaged areas. 
So as we look at the the impacts, the locations of this, um, these are these are things to me that that really shout out that uh, they're things that need to be addressed. So the other thing I'll say is that that's I'd say super important here is that you know a lot of these wells uh, not only emit methane but they they can have oil spills. Uh, one of the big things that we see with a lot of these are brine spills. And you can think, well, you know, if it's brine or oil spill, that's not emitting methane, perhaps. But we do a lot of nature-based credits in those types of projects. And so if I can go in to talk to our Oklahoma Attorney General and, and his property in Osage County, Oklahoma, and it's got uh, impacts of historic oil and gas with, with salt-impacted soils and, and old wells, um, those impact negatively his ability to to get the most out of his property for 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 doing nature based carbon uh, reduction. So there, there's a lot of ways that we can look at this. But what I will say is that as we look at trying to compare nature based approaches, you know, planting trees and soils and all that compared to what we do with individually plugging uh, idle and orphan wells, marginal wells. Uh, these wells can typically, what we see a lot is can typically be emitting 10,000 to 500,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent over a 20 year period. Plugging these wells provides an immediate impact by eliminating harmful and quantifiable emissions that are verifiable. You know, this isn't like we're not out measuring the diameter of trees or doing LIDAR and LDAR and all these different things and, and, and making estimates, we know we're making a significant immediate impact. So the issue of additionality is, is very solid. And we'll get into some other things that I know have that people have expressed concerns over in the past. But these wells are not without risk and challenges. I've, I've, I've presented some of these or a lot of these in past presentations. Um, but you can imagine with equipment and gas and telling welders that methane is actually explosive uh, and can catch fire because sometimes they forget. But, you you know, you'll have to do this sometimes in the middle of schools, under buildings. You know, we're, we're working on some out in California where, you know, people put structures there. I've had a, a conversation with REI here in Oklahoma that's putting a, a new facility uh, and over over an old oil and gas development field where there were a number of wells in the area. So lots of things to look at and think about. We have a Walmart uh, distribution center here that's got about 500 wells within a two mile radius of just that distribution center. So when you look at all these things and 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 so forth and the risks and challenges, um, there's a lot to consider. I'll tell you the other thing, and is that I really try to uh, try to help people understand is I always expect the unexpected, and this is just one example. Hennessy, Oklahoma, 1966. You know, an old well that was originally drilled not very deep, 2,300 feet, uh, just out of the blue explodes, shooting you know flames 100 feet in the air. This isn't that similar to what recently happened in Colorado. I mean. These things happen. I can give you probably 50 cases of, of these kinds of things happening over time. So I would just say, as you go in to do the plugging, the analysis, the, the testing, I always expect the unexpected. So the other thing, and I know I'm going through a lot of this quick, I'm, I've got my contact information at the end. So hopefully if, if anybody does have any, any questions, you can, you can reach out to me later. But uh, one thing that has got a lot of people concerned about the carbon credit end of, of, um, of things with uh, idle orphan marginal well plugging uh, is a new EPA methane rule. So what I will say is the rule itself for EPA is applicable to existing facility or new facilities. Um, as of December of 2022, uh, it's got some time to go, to go into its effectiveness uh, probably March or April 2024, but then for existing facilities, um, that would go into play after states include or develop a state implementation plan, 
um, to, to, to let EPA know and, and for EPA to approve on how they're going to handle those things. Um, I will say that if you look through the comments and so forth, there's a lot of questions by many states that uh, that the rule, uh, they're, they're questioning EPA's authority on what they're trying to do. But moreover, I would say there's there was a lot of concerns from states especially that doing this would turn a lot of uh, marginal and idle wells into orphan wells. But even with that, those concerns, if you read the rules, it's unclear uh, if the rules in general do or would ever include orphan wells or non-producing wells. So there's there's a lot of stuff in here to uh, to to just keep in mind. So I would just encourage you as you as you look at the rule, uh, go through it in detail. Uh, work with the states. We're hoping to work with. We've been already talking with a couple of attorney generals on their state implementation plan. So um, I, I think there, this is like, this rule is not something that has me too worried about uh, carbon credits and orphan and idle wells, especially. Um, and then using those credits, you can imagine the, the various differences from, from idle wells, orphan wells, and we have so many very, very low producing um, <clears throat> marginal wells, wells that are producing quarts of oil per day, maybe. Uh, so, you know, we have a lot that are, um, that I would say are on the verge of turning into idle and even into orphan. But within that, I would say, as you look at this, there's a lot of research you could do on the, the voluntary carbon market, the various mandatory markets, the various registries that are out there. ACR just recently uh, issued their first credits uh, to Rebellion Energy for some well plugging. But there's B carbon that is they're really looking at idle and orphan carbon pass out there onyx zero six uh, vera is developing uh, a methodology there's a lot of these out there lots of different options and what i will what i will tell you is that as we look at this depending on the wells you have in the situations one registry may not address all of your needs for every single well so you may be you know, if you're looking at being a project developer, I think there's probably some of those folks on this call uh, that um, that considering that you may have to be dealing with multiple registries is something to be prepared for. Um, and then as you look at those, I would say I'm going to really try to just get something in, in, you know, lay out there, you know, before I uh, run out of this. Uh, is that we typically think of carbon credits as carbon offset credits. But one of the things that I think is very applicable is as we look at carbon insets. So, so there's opportunities for you to do inset credits. Um, and, and, if you, and if you research what inset credits are, and, and really offsets are kind of the same, it's a little confusing. But these are where you're doing credits to positively impact the communities that you're in, the landscapes, the ecosystems associated with your company's value chain, um, as, as well as a number of different things to, to mitigate that before uh, things are doing as opposed to an offset. So for instance, if you look at in America, you know, LNG, uh, there's a lot of, it's, it's growing substantially, you know, and being uh, transported to a number of different areas. There's a lot of concerns uh, that note the emissions uh, associated with the production, processing, liquefaction, and transport of natural gas um, make the life cycle of LNG exports worse than coal, contributing to the pace of climate warming. There's all sorts of things that you can find there. And and if you look at this, I would just say that there's there's a there's a lot of efforts to really think about do we want this or not and uh, and and what do we do and i think that the lng industry that lng export industry is perfect for doing carbon insetting so that they can plug wells uh you know apply them to those shipments uh and then and then as they deliver those those would be neutral and if you look at okay you know is this is this a possibility for them well, when you look at the transport emissions from tankers uh, they're they're not insignificant as well as the cargo and and the metric tons of emissions downstream. 
So applying, you know, well plugging carbon credits to LNG exports, I mean, it's it's in their industry. If you look at the Gulf Coast there, the number of, you know, of orphan, idle, uh, non-producing and low marginal wells uh, with just a 50 mile um, radius of the of the coast is substantial. And, you know, these these LNG companies could plug five or 10 or 15 um, wells um, to neutralize uh, their shipments. So it'd be significant. And if you look at just the history, like the Goose Creek oil field, I mean, it, this is, you know, this this is Texas's early history in oil and gas is this region. So I'm trying to fly through here, but, you know, if we look at at what we had to deal with, it's over three and a half million orphan idle marginal conventional wells no amount of government funding or, or, or things are going to address this. This is going to have to be done by the private sector. The carbon industry, I believe, is, is going to be critical. I, I see that as about the only way we're going to make this really happen. I think that uh, there will be a plethora of lawsuits regarding EPA's methane rules. The states are going to address some of this to, to the extent they can in their state implementation plans. There's also questions about what is and is not applicable. So there's there's a lot going on there, but still, this isn't going to get solved just by some new EPA rule. <clears throat> and and like I note here, states have the option to include well plugging for carbon credits as an approved methodology in their SIP. Um, but even with the EPA methane rule, you know the the argument for additionality. Uh, is not tanked. So this is this is stuff that that is is a big deal. I will say that there's a number of companies that are really thinking twice about this whole becoming carbon neutral and wanting to say, hey, we want to become better. We want to do the right thing. We want to do things in our ecosystems and our area and in our industry and things that we know that are that can provide an immediate, quantifiable, verifiable, and permanent result. And that's what we can get with plugging these orphan, idle, and even low marginal conventional wells. So uh, I, I will say that there's a lot of interest in this. I've talked to a lot of trading companies. There's, you know, I think that we are on the verge of something pretty significant here. So I would just tell everybody to, to, to hang on. And, uh, and so here's my contact information. I, I included a picture here. This is, uh, from about a year ago in North Texas uh, on a case that I was doing for the Securities and Exchange Commission. And if you look at that well there, the other thing I wanna, I wanna warn everybody about is what you see on databases and on the internet isn't always true. So if you, if you were to look at this particular well, and I had to cover the sign up, but if you look at this particular well, this is supposed to be an active well with monthly reported production every month for which someone was uh, uh, was was gaining investments for. So I'm just telling you, in the oil industry, in every industry, everything you see uh, isn't true, and you have to go out there and look at things. So, you know, please, you know, before you send workers out there and all that, um, make sure you know what you're dealing with. So that's all I have. Um, Susan, I don't know if you want to do questions now because I, I I don't have a lot of time to to uh, uh um I think that we I think that that's good I think um we're at 1225 so we probably need to move along in the program so you have your contact information so people can contact you directly and I just want to thank you for an outstanding presentation all right thanks and, and, and uh and a too and yep. also, so Amanda, would you like to go next? Amanda Vizet, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody. Thanks, Susan, for the invitation and for Dan. And it's good to see Sean. Um, let me share my screen here. Looks good. All right, can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. Um, so 
I'm going to take a little bit of a different tact than Dan did. Um, Dan and I are good friends. We've known each other for a long time. Um, but I am a geologist. And so I'm, I'm looking at orphan and abandoned wells from the perspective of a geologist and what it takes to get wells plugged. And so what I wanted to just briefly talk about today, because I don't have a whole lot of time, was um, just my, my thoughts on looking back at some of the wells that I've looked at, um, the wells that I've plugged, um, and just give some of my thoughts on them. Um, and so my, my talk today is titled of Snowflakes and Old Wells. And you'll see in a moment why I titled my talk this way. Yeah, so when you're in the middle of a blizzard, as folks in Buffalo, New York, and the Northeast recently were, you don't really think too much about individual snowflakes that exist in the massive drifts of snow. Um, so you take a look on the left-hand side. This was from last week in Buffalo, and you've got kids on top of a car, basically digging that car out of the snow. Um, those snow drifts are sort of like the orphan well problem. They're made up of individual snowflakes. The orphan well, abandoned well, idle well issue is made up of thousands and thousands of wells. Um, but when you've got big drifts like this, all you want to do is move the snow so you can get on with your normal life. And um, there's an old saying that no two snowflakes are the same. And why is that? Well, researchers have worked on this problem for ages. And as you can see on the left hand side or right hand side, there are just a couple pictures of snowflakes and they all look different. Um, and it boils down to many factors that go into how a snowflake is created. The amount of moisture in the air, the temperature, um, at what elevation did those crystals develop and how clean or dirty the air is on the way down as the snow is falling. All of those impact um, snowflake development, and therefore no two are alike. Um, and so just as individual snowflakes are unique to multiple factors, orphan, abandoned, idle gas wells and oil wells are, are, are the same. You can sort of apply the same thought process to them. Yep. So many of you have seen this map published by Environmental Defense Fund in 2021. Let's see. It's not there. I think it didn't advance. It might. Uh, yep. I see. Hang on. Okay. There we go. Oh, too far. Yep. So um, this map is just from Environmental Defense Fund. Dan showed a version of it earlier, um, just locating documented orphan and abandoned wells. Um, darker colors represent higher density per unit of area. And so while that exact number is growing every day due to efforts to identify, locate, and characterize wells, um, USGS is estimating around 120,000 wells. Um, but for me as a geologist with a well plugging service company, um, that exact number doesn't really matter. Um, I'm more interested in what it takes to get the wells plugged. And so looking at each well on an individual basis is what I'm, what I'm looking at here. So when you think about orphan wells, abandoned wells, idle wells, um, old wells, um, what image comes through your head? So Dan showed a whole bunch of pictures. Um, I've got a bunch of pictures as well. We've all got bunches of pictures. Um, so these wells are, you know, obviously in open and rural areas from left to right. You've got wells in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Montana, again in Pennsylvania and in Kentucky. Um, so these are just a subset of wells. They all look different. Right. So, you know, out in the in the carbon world, there's this thought that all orphan wells look the same and act the same and they don't. Um, additionally, they're not all in the same kinds of locations. So just as I showed you uh, rural wells or wells kind of out in the open, 
We're also dealing with wells that are in urbanized areas. Um, so for example, um, on the left-hand side, this pipe sticking out of the ground is, a, uh, is actually a gas well that was installed prior to a trailer park development. Um, and so that, uh, that vertical pipe sticking up out of the ground is venting an abandoned gas well that's 10 feet from a child's bedroom um, in a trailer park. Um, then we've got a couple pictures of parking lots um, the the uh, picture on the top is actually um, in the parking lot of a hospice facility um, in Erie, Pennsylvania, and the well is you know, less than five feet away from the building and about 100 yards from Lake Erie. So there are some environmental issues there. The photo on the bottom, the well is in the parking lot just, uh, just below the fence. It's in a mixed residential and uh, uh, industrial and commercial area. So the property that the well is on was an old motel. There is a nursery behind it. And then there's a neighborhood just to the left of it off the screen. And the photograph on the right hand side uh, shows a well that we are currently on. We are currently bailing that well out and it is uh, five feet off of a guy's front porch in downtown Cleveland, Ohio. So what are the factors that go into how orphan abandoned idle wells are all different? Well, we gotta kind of go back to the basics of um, the petroleum world, right? So we gotta go back as petroleum geologists and engineers and consider what made someone want to produce hydrocarbons in that particular spot in the first place. So as geologists, we're trained to look at source, migration, reservoir, trap, and seal. And these geologic conditions of the subsurface are going to be different, obviously, in different plays, different geographic regions. And we just need to be mindful that reservoir conditions may have changed or shallow condition, shallow hazards may be in place or that those conditions may have changed just yards or blocks away. So um, for our friends in the carbon world who are not familiar with petroleum geology at all, um, the, the subsurface is not one big flat pancake. Um, there's a lot of variability in the subsurface, both in where hydrocarbons are located and the reservoirs that they're found. Additionally, uh, we need to think about how, how a well was drilled, how it was constructed, what materials were used, um, was it drilled uh, with a, like a cable tool, was it drilled with percussive tool, is the casing made out of wood or is the casing made out of steel? Was the steel casing removed during World War II to support our military in building ships for, for the war effort? Um, what methods were used at the time? And are there notes on any wells in that particular area? What about shallow gas or water bearing zones? Um, have wells in that area had previous well interventions? Has somebody gone in after the fact and put in a packer that you don't know about or put in equipment that you may not have accounted for? What about surface development around the well? And what about previous plugging attempts? And that is something that we're encountering here in Northwestern Pennsylvania and Ohio is we are now re-entering wells that were plugged back in the 40s and 50s, um, back before there were plugging standards, and those plugs are now failing. Um, and so it's, it's taking a lot to undo those plugs, to drill them back out, and to clean out the well and basically start from scratch. So what I want to say is that each well plugging job is unique. Um, all, of the, all of these projects have the same goals, to seal off the reservoir, to eliminate pathways for gas and fluid migration to the surface and to remediate the site to original conditions um, so that uh, people who live there have cleaner environments or the land can be reused. What may change 
would be things like rig selection. What kind of rig can you actually bring into that location to do the job correctly? What kinds of plugs, what kind of cement can you use um, in order to get an effective plug job? And what kinds of surface remediation do you need to do in order to um, achieve certain goals and standards? So just to wrap it up, there's a lot of work to do in the orphan and abandoned well space. And regardless of the work or regardless of how that work is paid for, whether it's publicly or privately funded, there's a lot of work to do and many ways to get there. And with that being said, I would love to continue this conversation with you in February here in Pittsburgh at the APG Orphan Well Conference in a few weeks. And hopefully we don't get another big snowstorm before the event, but if we do, or if we get it while we're here, we can ponder the individual snowflakes over a cup of coffee and some good conversation. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Thank you, that's great. <laughs> And um, yes, fingers crossed about the weather, <laughs> but you guys have snow plows, so that's yeah. good. Um, well, that was wonderful. And, and I just wanted to thank you again, too, uh, for actually suggesting our venue in um, Pittsburgh. It'll be Cranberry, and it's just really nice. So I'm really thrilled now to be able to segue into how we operationalize all this with the measurements and 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 for monitoring and monetization. So welcome, Sean. It's Sean Epps of Heath. Thanks, Susan. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, looking forward to the conference uh, uh, up in uh, Cranberry Township, great little town up there. Um, and looking forward to Amanda seeing you and, and Dan there and for help and assist with the measurement specialist training workshop that's gonna be on the 29th following the conference. Um, that I believe you got to register for separately, right, Susan? Um, I, I, but um, right. right, okay. And um, so that'll be a lot of fun. And so um, I know the last conference we did in Oklahoma City was a uh, was a huge. Uh, it was my first uh, time participating in APG myself, but um, it was a great conference. And a little background about Heath. What I'm talking about today is. Um, um, I'm going to be kind of talking about a, a basic toolbox, a toolbox approach, and um, you know, uh, basically uh, uh, my approach to uh, on the methane emissions uh, leak detection, the the survey of the fi finding out are the wells leaking or not, and then how to quantify them. Because as Amanda said, you know, no snowflakes are the same. There's different wells out there, and so there's not really always a 100% cookie cutter way to measure every well. And so I'll share with you um, some of the experiences um, I've had at a, at a few locations working with clients um, and uh, try to share with you some be best practices as well as go through uh, some of the latest updates based on customer feedback we've received to um, help aid, particularly um, in the carbon credit approval process, which I'll get into. Um, using the Syntec High Flow 2. A little background about Heath Consultants. We have been around since 1933, where we were originally uh, founded in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, started out as, I believe, the first leak survey, natural gas leak survey company in, in, in the U.S., possibly even the world. Um, and we, uh, they were trying to figure out why there was all the dead, dead trees in Boston. And so um, we started out as an as a, as a OVA or olfactory, uh, you know, uh, audit, auditory, visual, and uh, sense of smell vegetation leak survey company. But we quickly got into developing methane leak detection and natural gas leak detection products, particularly for the utility industry in the 50s. Um, today, we are a product and service provider for uh, everything from you know, uh, uh, orphan wells to idle marginal stripper wells to large production well pads to, uh, we're very uh, active in the midstream space and downstream. Um, we're out of Houston, Texas, um, where I'm at our office right now. It's right located next to Hobby Airport. We've got 2000 employees. Um, I'm our business development manager and I'm over our greenhouse gas emissions uh, management technology. Um, and so, um, so I, I particularly focus on a uh, 
particular part of our business, which is more on the measurement side. That's our manufacturing facility there. It's 22,000 square feet where we build and manufacture a lot of the products such as the, uh, the RMLD that Dan had in his photo in one of the previous presentations. Uh, it's a methane uh, open path laser that we use to screen for methane leaks out there. Uh, but our where I where I started out with Heath was in our our GHG measurement uh, division, which was formed in 2002, uh, and it it began with um, we helped commercialize and develop the first uh, high flow sampler to the market, which was um, quickly accepted by EPA Natural Gas Star back in the day. Um, as a acceptable method for measuring and quantifying what we call fugitive emissions or uh, venting methane hey, emissions from different hey, sources. Hey, Sean, we're, we're not seeing your slides advance. Uh-oh. Yeah, I just, so let's see why that's happening. Uh, is Thank you for mentioning that. Tonight? I thought maybe it was just me. I've been having Zoom gremlins. <laughs> where, where are y'all at? We're still it's on slide perfect. one. Thanks, Sean. Uh-oh. Let's see. Must be the internet. I don't know. It looks like you're using PDF. So you might have to manually. Yeah, let me do that. Let me uh, let me do this. Sorry about that. It won't that. advance. You'll just have to manually select. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I apologize. Let's go to. Let's try this. Okay. Can you all see that slide? I'm going to do it this way. Yes, it's moving now. Okay, perfect. All right, we're just going to do it the old-fashioned way. Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that was our, I don't want to keep the ball rolling forward. Um, so one of the tools we build um, out of Houston here is the, the RMLD that I mentioned to you about, this this device. It's a remote methane leak detector complete solution. Um it is a what we call a screening tool. Um, it's it is recognized by the EPA and by uh, FEMSA Pipeline Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. It is used in the industry. We have thousands of them being used for compliance for everything from very pipeline leak detection for distribution uh, for public safety, measuring uh, or, or, or surveying uh, uh, distribution mains services to transmission, gathering pipelines. And then um, we also have a lot of operators that use it as part of their um, uh, uh, the LDAR program uh, and the upstream uh, sector for uh, managing their uh, emissions. Um, so it's a handheld tool basically that's an active laser that's methane specific. And it's got about a 22 inch diameter footprint at a uh, at 100 feet. So uh, it's got a, it's like kind of like a shotgun scatter type conical beam, and um, it works really well at, at uh, remotely detecting leaks. And that's important. Why it's ideal for a lot of these orphan wells is because you don't, as in this kind of illustration here, where I have a buried pipeline leak. Some of these wells are not always visible. Um, they're buried. We can't see them. They might have been plugged or back like uh, Dan mentioned during the World War II era. They're cutting off the pipes off of these wells. So sometimes if you're marching through on the initial run through trying to find these wells, it can be very challenging. And if you actually have had a, a, several clients who uh, have been able to actually pinpoint some of these wells that are covered up by vegetation and, and, and by actually scanning the laser around the suspected area and picking up the venting methane from as it passes through, migrates through the ground and vents, vents the atmosphere with the laser. So that's really ideal because that way you have a laser you can scan and you're not just limited to a point, sni uh, a point sniffer or a point sensor that, that's pulling in a sample like a sniffer. Um, so that's pretty handy to have. Um, <clears throat> a little, um, see if I can play this quick video. Uh, I'm not sure if y'all can hear the audio, but there's an alarm that's going off on the uh, RMLD here. It's picking up a leak that's coming from this orphan well next to a baseball field. Um, here's one where I'm pointing it at the uh, pump jack here, and it, it's picking up uh, the wells. It's uh, leaking through the uh, rod slip here. Um, I've also got uh, this device also captures images in the field. So when you are out there, you can get GPS 
but this is not a quantification tool. This is you'll get an idea of the uh, the the concentration of methane, but ultimately dealing with wind and and, the, and different factors. Um, we're mostly just using this as a prioritization tool. Say we have a really bad leak at this location, um, and then from there we will quantify it. And and that step involves using the Syntec High Flow Two, um, which is the uh, a uh, the I. It's a very versatile tool. As mentioned earlier, you know this is a uh, we helped commercialize the first one back in the two thousands, but the Syntec High Flow Two is the latest technology that meets the um, ACR requirements and um, the DOE DOI requirements for uh, measuring uh, orphan wells, as well as also it meets EPAs, as Dan was mentioned about that methane rule. It's an 1800 page rule, huge rule, but also the uh, high flow uh, is, is uh, referenced in the rule and it's actually an approved technology as well. And similar to ACR, the Syntec High Flow 2 is unique because it uh, is methane specific. And the if you are doing carbon credits um, or if you're looking at uh, doing federally funded wells, they, you do need to make sure that you're only capturing, quantifying the methane. And so you have to make sure you're using methods to do that. Um, the, uh, with the sensor technology we have in the Syntec High Flow 2, um, it, it measures only methane. The old original uh, back rack high flow samplers discontinued was whole gas. So it measured other hydrocarbons besides methane. So technically it wouldn't have um, meets today's requirements. But since it's methane specific and it measures uh, less than a gram per hour, it works really great. But how does it work? Um, basically, um, you're instead of passively measuring like you would through like a, a vent meet, uh, a flow meter um, that's like an inline flow meter, we actually have a, um, a, we're sampling the gas. That's why we call it a high volume sample. We're, we're um, uh, basically uh, uh, taking the surrounding air and we are, are drawing in the, the leak, the entire leak. That's very important. Make sure you capture the entire leak, but we're also drawing it in with outside air to determine our flow. So once we have our flow, then we're measuring the concentration of that leak as it, as it passes through. And so basically flow times concentration to get our leak rate. Um, so it's um, specification wise with the current setup you see in the picture here, the Semtec High Flow 2 will uh, measure uh, flow rates up to 35 CFM with this particular handheld attachment. Um, they are, they are, um, uh, there's going to be other attachments available though, that are capable of going up to 500 cubic feet per minute, which we can save for another webinar another day, but, um, that, that will work with the, uh, methane, uh, analyzer, the, the analyzer, your, your Syntec high flow too. Um, so, but this particular, um, handheld, we actually, that's the, 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 the uh, fan housing in the back that actually creates and, and sucks in the sample for you. And then we have a, a, a sample uh, hose that runs to the analyzer so we can analyze the gas and get your methane concentration and uh, determine the leak rate, which we can measure anywhere from uh, 0.0005 grams, uh, I'm sorry, 0 0.0005 uh, uh, cubic feet per minute to up to 25 uh, cubic feet per minute. So that's equivalent to about less than a gram per an hour. And uh, basically we can run the machine all day and um, and it works really well for that. So some of the advantages is that the, the meter itself is just a simple pitot tube, which means that pressure, um, it can handle large, large, uh, large pressure. Um, they put pitot tubes uh, to measure the velocity of wind on aircraft wings going 300 miles an hour through the sky. So it's a very reliable, accurate uh, flow meter that's a simple design and can handle very uh, high pressure output. Um, so the user interface on this device, basically, this is just a simple dashboard that you initially see and, and how when you're out there in the field measuring, you would be uh, interfacing with this dashboard, either using your 
your phone like I have here, an Apple or Android phone. You could use a tablet or you could use a win uh, Windows operating uh, system as well. Um, and so you can also do that as well. Um, and so while you're in the field, what we we can while we're while we're measuring, we can capture real time readings and second by second uh, 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 capability. So as you're measuring a well, for example, some of these wells they 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 sometimes if it's just an atmospheric ca uh, a, a casing that's venting the atmosphere, like you'll see in some pictures shortly, they just vent the atmosphere and they sometimes will breathe because there might be a water column. We may not know the depth of that water column. It could be 20 feet uh, below in the ground, or it could be uh, several hundred feet down below. But sometimes that gas uh, in, in, on a uh, on a on a opened uh, casing is just venting atmospherically. So we can actually really easily capture and see that breathing with with the high flow and those type of uh, those type of measurements. Um, one of the things that uh, we do, uh, well, there was a study that was done a couple of years back. Um, for uh, California Air Resources Board, and it was uh, the study was performed at Colorado State University's uh, METEC facility, which is, stands for Methane Emissions Technology Evaluation Center. METEC uh, has a, a field a setup of um, where they uh, where they will it's a out, outside laboratory out in Colorado where they they have uh, leaks at, leaking at known rates, and there's lots of different pretty much a lot of different methane leak detection technology goes through that center to get evaluated and tested. And, um, and so a lot of studies have come out of the uh, METEC, but this particular study was done on uh, high flow samplers. And what the study helped conclude was that the high flow would meet the uh, current proposed, uh, well, the current finalized EPA quad OB regulation, uh, uh, the EPA's, uh, Subpart W uh, requirement for um, uh, uh, measuring uh, uh, their green, the uh, reporting greenhouse gas emissions. Subpart W, and then also ACR um, uh, as well. So it helped validate that. Um, so we have lots of empirical data to help to help uh, uh, with uh, assist. And I'm mentioning ACR a lot because right now um, they actually had a a, uh, a press release last week. And in that press release, um, they were, uh, it was about uh, ACR just finally uh, approved their first and issued their first carbon credits to um, Rebellion Energy. And there's, uh, you can go to their website and they got a press release on it for more information. Um, but that was a, a, a huge success for Rebellion. Um, and uh, so uh, we've, uh, I've, we we uh, the the Syntec High Flow Two will uh, was was instrumental in helping get to uh, to help get those credits approved, and uh, so there is you know ACR has a methodology that the the High Flow is written into. Uh, so again, this is just a quick. I got to go through this quickly for limited time, but if you go into the eighteen hundred page rule for uh, EPA's Quad OB. In Quad OC, as Dan was um, talking about earlier, uh, they get pretty specific in the requirements for um, uh, for the high flow sampling equipment you're using, and it's somewhat similar to some of the requirements for VOI and, and uh, ACR. But you have to have uh, basically a methane specific sensor. Um, you can't have any cross interference that exceeds two and a half percent of of other hydrocarbons. Um, you need to have a accurate measurement technology that's within 5% accuracy. And you also must have a very low uh, background signal, um, which really can only be achieved with like a laser-based type sensor. It's difficult to do that with some of the uh, less lower cost sensors out there. They have just too much drift. And that's one reason why we can measure down to very low, low uh, requirements. So here's a quick video uh a annulus or um uh, that's venting to prevent gas locking on this well this is actually not an orphan well um but you know this is all uh grandfathered in um but uh it gives you a good example of some of the sources that uh some of the operators are real interested in and in quantifying 
just like this video because it shows um, how easy it is to uh, capture the sample, uh, but also shows how the Opgal IC gas is being utilized to verify complete capture and as a QE, QA, QC type tool, the, the actual camera that the video uh, uh, that's running the video. And so uh, the Opgal IC gas is, uh, is a great visualization tool out there. Um, for visualizing some of these uh, sources out there that are leaking some of these wells. Uh, here's another video that's more of a first-person view through the, through the glare shield of another orphan well that's basically just a casing that's venting out of the ground. And you can actually see in this video the methane being, or uh, the gas being sucked into the high flow. And so... Uh, if you were to do like a two-hour measurement, for example, we'd probably set up a different setup. But if you just want to go out there and measure it and get a baseline of what that well is uh, leaking, you can quickly get those results by turning on this machine and, and, and capturing a sample. Um, so here's just a couple more setups, uh, more of what I would call a, a longer term, longer measurement period setup. Um, ACR calls for doing a two, uh, at least a two-hour stabilized uh, measurement test. Um, so um, some of these wells are, have multiple leaks on them that are, are venting the atmosphere uh, uncontrolled. So the key is you want to capture, you know, it's easier to capture all of them at once if you can and measure it all together for one at one well. So... Uh, in this case, um, to kind of protect it from wind and to make sure we're getting a good capture and, and, and nothing's escaping, um, we're loosely enclosing it with a, uh, with a, a with a tarp um, to measure some of these wells. And so when you do that, you know, you don't want to cut off outside airflow because you do need to have, as mentioned, ambient air being pulled in. Because if we lose flow as we're pulling it in, we're going to lose our leak rate. So as long... So the key is to make sure you're capturing all the gas and um, and make sure that you have good flow going into the machine. And then we can uh, easily get a, a stabilized leak rate that way. Um, got a few more minutes here, but you have, um, here's one I just want to show you. This is an orphan well in Texas, this huge 25 foot Christmas tree here. So they come in all shapes and sizes. And on that particular day, we had wells going up and down the Christmas tree, including that were leaking out of the cellar uh, or the vault that was flooded. So we actually had to cover up that cellar with a tarp. And so this one, uh, this kind of is one where it's, it's a little difficult to imagine putting a huge chamber over. So uh, sometimes you have to approach these um, in, in different ways. Uh, here's a couple that were leaking outside where I have the tarp on the ground because the gas was not the leak was actually as a fell casing and it was migrating through the soil and venting the atmosphere. It was coming off of the wellhead itself. So we uh, were out on the casing. So we actually were trying to quantify it was coming up through the soil. So we, we, we covered it up to make sure we were trapping all the gas. And then we were, we would put the high flow underneath to uh, quantify what was venting from, uh, from around the wellhead uh, through the ground. Here's one where, it's just an open casing, and it was so windy that day, uh, it made more sense to drop just a uh, 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 the the hose, the cam lock hose, right down into the uh, into the actual casing, and we didn't need to cover it up or seal it off because we're again we were actively measuring, um, so there's nothing that needed to be sealed off. We're actually pulling that sample in, so um, works really well for those type of scenarios. A uh, couple of other applications include uh, the, uh, the, the crankcases, blowdown valves. Uh, here's one in a neighborhood where we're measuring a buried leak that's on a main line of a distribution and a, and a for utility. So there's other applications too. But we also um, are adding some new features like geofencing, where you'll be able to uh, geofence your asset, for example, and the field, and you can create as many geofences and save them on the machine as you want. Um, and, and then we're also um, adding in a new standardized automated process that 
uh, meets the a ACR's uh, methodology that also will audit the measurement as you're going along and tell you, um, is it stabilized? Um, does it, uh, you know, it will go ahead and self audit it. So all the operator really needs to do, is make sure his equipment set up properly. And then he turns on and the test will run by itself. And for the two hour period, uh, 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 to capture the data. And then when he, when you're done with that test, you get a, uh, uh, just a couple more pictures on how, how we can easily create geofences with internally. And you can do this in the field with the software, but, um, you can create PDF reports now that, that are automated. And so that PDF report, just a, this is a partial, just a peek at it, but you, you, you can get your, your minimum average maximum readings, you can over a two hour time frame, for example, um, you can capture the leak rate, the concentration and your flow. Also, you can get a check, an, uh, an audit check that says, OK, did it meet all the standards that uh, your carbon registry requires? So this could be done for other registries as well. If, if there's other standards that that come up, uh, you also have raw data, which is very important if you're putting this on a blockchain. Uh, it's it's second by second data logging. Um, it's in a CSV file format, and we're capturing everything that you need to audit the 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 uh, instrument. You can tell what mode it's in. There's uh, notes areas. Uh, uh, it's uh, you can configure these templates. Uh, basically, you can select. Uh, you can create like a fully loaded template, and you can create a more basic template for easier interpretation. Um, uh, but it's uh, and also we have a SQL server uh, capabilities. We don't have a a cloud server uh, that that. Uh, but if you have your own cloud server, uh, you know, we could potentially uh, link that up to that for you guys. And uh, just a few more pictures, but I think it's a little over to Mark. But um, thanks so much for your time. And uh and it was very, uh, really great to uh, present. And, and Susan, if there's anything I need to add or if there's any, anything you want to add, any, any questions? Um, that was great. I think we are a little bit over time. I don't see any questions. Um, well, <laughs> if anybody has any, I put them in the chat. And in the meantime, I just want to thank our sponsors. We have Invana, Capstone, CSR, Keith, Purvis Center Foundation, and Zafiro Methane. So I'm really excited that we have so many sponsors for this webinar and, and also for our, our conference. And also I just want to say thank you for, for having such a um, practical and applicable talk. I also want to acknowledge um, Bert Vogler, if he's here still, that he's our president of, of the Division of Econo um, Environmental Ge Geoscientists. So Bert, if you're here, if you want to Say a few words. Uh, I'd like to thank all three of the presenters. Uh, I enjoyed all three presentations and uh, I'm uh, very uh, happy uh, our Division of Environmental Geosciences was able to uh, help sponsor this. So thanks everyone for attending. Well, thank you. And I just want to encourage everyone to renew your membership with AAPG and check the box for DEG. <laughs> this is, it's a, a great division. We have a lot of things going on. So it's a, it's a huge opportunity, things we've never seen really up to now in, in the industry. So it's exciting. And it's what I like about it too is that it's, it's science-based. So when we talk about carbon credits and measurement, et cetera, we have we have the equipment that um, Sean told us about, and then we have the methodologies and the approaches and the experience that Amanda and also Dan told us about. So if we don't have any questions right now, I just want to thank everybody for being a part of this fantastic webinar today. You will be receiving an email with a link to the recording. So I know that a lot of people had um, the very wily Zoom gremlins <laughs> coming into play. So we'll definitely, you'll be able to watch it again. And also you'll have contact information for our presenters so you can follow up. So thank you again, and we'll see you at the next one.